Well, events have continued to speed along on the world scene. A tremendous amount of things have occurred in just uh, the most recent weeks. Particularly, the uh, matter of note has been uh, the circumstance uh, in the Soviet Union and the virtual uh, dis, uh, the unraveling uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, becoming very quickly the Soviet disunion, because uh, uh, of a tremendous number of things that have occurred. Now, this raises a lot of questions. A lot of people have wondered uh, some of the things that uh, this portends on the world scene. I have alluded to it and have made comments on it uh, over the portion of the last uh, two or three weeks. Uh, various comments have been made. Of course, I've made comments over the years uh, focusing in on certain aspects of prophecy and focusing in on events in the Soviet Union uh, and at least allusions to it. But never have I really taken the time to just simply go through in a very uh, detailed and systematic way. And that's sort of what I would like to, to focus in on today a little bit uh, about helping us to understand where the turmoil that is taking place uh, right now, where that turmoil is leading. How did it come about? Uh, why is it going on? What does it mean? How does it fit in with Bible prophecy? What does it have to do with where we find ourselves right now? We, of course, here today just a matter of a couple of days prior to the Feast of Trumpets, the festival that symbolizes the return of Jesus Christ to this earth, or at least symbolizes the series of events that culminates with the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. It focuses in, as we uh, are here at the Feast of Trumpet season and the entire fall festival season, it focuses our attention on the time of God's stepping into history, God's intervention in the affairs of man and bringing about his plan, bringing about the accomplishment and the fulfillment of his great plan. We see many things going on on the world scene. Some of these have significance, others are just simply uh, uh, minor matters. They, they uh, occupy headlines for a few days. Uh, they disappear and really uh, only had minor significance in terms of the overall scheme of things. But there are events that are going on that are, that are setting the stage for the arisal in Europe of what is known in biblical prophecy as the beast. Uh, you read of that in Revelation 13, Revelation 17. You read of it back in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, you read a parallel account in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, these are descriptive terms, and I, I don't have time, of course, to go into every aspect uh, in one sermon. But I want to focus in particularly on what is occurring in the Soviet Union on the turmoil that is taking place there and where it's going to lead, what's going to result from it. Uh, and how does this fit in to the prophecies in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 talking about the arrival, the, the arising in Europe uh, of this entity described in biblical prophecy uh, as a beast, a great, uh, powerful creature. Because that's, of course, uh, the, the term beast was, was a reference to a, a great, uh, uh, powerful wild animal, a great, uh, powerful creature. And God described some of these uh, various uh, Gentile world ruling empires uh, under the guise of, of wild animals, uh, did, that they exemplified certain of those characteristics. Now, when we get in... One of the things that has become apparent to a lot of people in the news uh, in recent, uh, recent weeks uh, has been the fact that what we have termed the Soviet Union is really a collection of many peoples. We in this country have, for many years, tended to use the terms Russia and the Soviet Union completely interchangeably. We thought of, of all the people over there as Russian. Well, that, of course, is not really the case. Uh, the Soviet Union, as it is presently constituted, has uh, consists of a number of different peoples who speak different languages. Now, several of these peoples, when we look in, in Bible prophecy, 
we find that nations are identified not by their modern day name, not by the name that you find on a modern day uh, geography atlas or in a modern uh, day newspaper or uh, news magazine, at least for the most part, uh, but the names that are used in the Bible are the names by which those peoples were known anciently, the names of their ancient biblical ancestor. In Genesis chapter 10, we will take note here very briefly in verse 1 that these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Now, when the human family was wiped out at the flood of Noah, God stepped into history. Uh, God obliterated life on the planet for the most part, certainly human life, and uh, apart from that which was preserved on the ark. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And we're told here that the sons of Japheth, the, uh, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, And Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Terus. Then we go into a breakdown of the uh, sons of Gomer, uh, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarmah. Uh, then we go on down through the various ones. I, I'm not going to go into all of these, uh, but we find here the sons of Japheth that are listed, and then uh, in verse 6, the sons of Ham, and then finally we come on down to uh, a little further in verse 22, the sons of Shem, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad and Lud and Aram. And we go into the, the basic... Um, the, the basic groups... As we're told in verse 5, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided, or the coasts of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nation. And uh, coming on down to verse 32 of Genesis 10, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Then in chapter 11, we find the whole earth was of one language and one speech. God intervened and confused the languages. So we have, we're introduced here to various branches of the human family. Because that's the way the human family started out, as a family. And, and uh, there are various branches of that family uh, that have given rise to uh, various, uh, various peoples. We find that... Uh, uh, don't want to get off into all of those, but there are several that we're going to note because they are of particular uh, particular importance in terms of, of what we're looking at. Two of the uh, sons here of Japheth, Meshach and Tubal, are linked together uh, throughout their history. They seem to have stayed together. Uh, there was an affinity. There was uh, evidently... Uh, uh, the the terms were are virtually always used together in the Bible, linked together, Meshach and Tubal. Evidently, uh, their descendants intermarried, became basically one uh, one group of people. Though there there may have been a couple of uh, let's say divisions that came out, but they basically have functioned as one people. We notice also that. Uh, uh, one of the uh, sons of Japheth uh, was is described here in verse two as Madai. Uh, that is uh, the ancestor from which the Medes are derived. In the Bible, we read about the Medes and the Persians. Well, the Medes uh, were descended from from uh, Madai here, one of the sons of Japheth. Uh, the Persians actually are are sort of derived uh, anciently as a subgroup of the Medes. Uh, later came to be the dominant uh, power there in the Middle East. But we're going to focus in a little bit on Meshach and Tubal. We're going to focus in on the Medes. And we're also going to note a little bit about one of the sons of Shem, whose name was Elam. 
uh, mentioned on down in verse 22. These, uh, these three groups, uh, Meshach and Tubal, uh, the Medes and the, El- and the people of Edom, the Elamites, are people that are going to play an important part in our story about the Soviet Union. Now, when we trace them down in history, I'm, I'm going to try and, and uh, I don't want to throw in too many details, but when we pick up some of these prophecies in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, you're going to have to have a little bit of background about knowing uh, about whom we are talking, because we're going to see that certain ones are identified in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel as doing particular things. And uh, we see uh, sort of the unraveling that is taking place in the Soviet Union right now. And we see that uh, it's becoming very apparent the Soviet Union is not just simply one people. It consists of many different groups of people uh, who have been allied or confederated together. And yet, uh, there are distinctions uh, among them. And uh, this gives rise to some of the events and some of the part that they're going to play in history. When we follow on down in history, uh, and you you may find it helpful, particularly if you've got a a good map in the back of your Bible, you may find it helpful to to turn back there uh, and to look. If you've got a map that shows uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and and on up above the, the Black and the Caspian Sea. Uh, Because if you have a good map in your Bible, it'll make it a little easier to follow some of this. Because some of these peoples migrated and they went to particular places. You know, the uh, human family didn't all start out exactly where they are. They started out uh, when the ark landed on Mount Ararat. Now, if 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 you're looking back... Uh, in, uh, in, in a map in the back of your Bible, and you look and you see the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, and you see a uh, uh, peninsula that comes out uh, there, uh, sort of the bottom of the Black Sea, uh, that is modern-day Turkey, probably labeled in your Bible uh, as Asia Minor. Uh, various peoples lived in that peninsula in times past, and then over right across from it is, is uh, Greece. Uh, and it comes on up, depends on how big your Bible map is, uh, but you have Greece and coming on up uh, north of that, uh, the area uh, that is today modern-day Yugoslavia, or what's left of Yugoslavia, uh, coming on up uh, the Adriatic Sea and Italy on the other side. So uh, you've, got, uh, you, you've got Italy, or the Italian peninsula, uh, then uh, between... Then you've got the Adriatic Sea coming down the Balkan Peninsula, ending down here in Greece. Uh, then you've got the Black Sea with what is now modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor under that. Uh, coming on across, you've got a little stretch of land uh, and uh, where the Black Sea and then a little stretch of land. And then you've got the Caspian Sea. Now, in between the Black and the Caspian Sea uh, is an area of mountains uh, that is where Mount Ararat was located uh, and is where the human family sort of uh, started after the flood because they came down from Mount Ararat, uh, came down into the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, and ultimately, of course, Nimrod built uh, the Tower of Babel there at Babylon. Well, various groups of the family spread out from there. We find, uh, according to the ancient historians, the Greek historians, that the descent that Meshach and Tubal, uh, we find in the early biblical record, we find them referred to as having settled that area right on the very southern shore of the Black Sea, and in, in what would uh, uh, in the top of the Asia Minor Peninsula, uh, the uh, Meshach and Tubal had settled some of that area right on sort of the southern part of the southern coast, sort of the south uh, western coast of the, of the Black Sea. Uh, the Greek historians, interestingly enough, refer to uh, them. Uh, the Greek name that was used was uh, uh, Moskoi, M-O-S-K-O-I. That was the Greek spelling of Meshach. Now, you may notice a uh, connection there. Moskoi may sound a little familiar uh, because that is the group of people that ultimately were pushed out of that area, came up across the Black Sea, uh, migrated on up sort of straight north of there, uh, and uh, that is the group of people from which what are termed the Great Russians are descended, uh, Meshach and Tubal. 
uh, the Moscow, the city of Moscow, takes its name from the Moscow River, uh, which was anciently named by these people, uh, took on their name because they settled up there, uh, called uh, uh, in the period, let's say, of about 500 B.C., about the time of the fall of Judah, uh, the uh, people of uh, Meshach and Tubal, called by the Greek historians Moscow, or Moscoi, uh, were settled up in that area. But right in the aftermath of that, you know, there were, there, peoples were dislocated. They, right in the aftermath of that became the, the great expansion of empires as Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian Empire swept across to the west. What happens is, of course, some of these people were dislocated. The people of Meshach and Tubal, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the onset of other more fierce peoples, uh, they left the area from where they were and went on up sort of on the, uh, uh, well, on the eastern, or, or excuse me, on the western and northwestern parts of the Black Sea, uh, came on up in that area up sort of on the uh, northwestern part of the Black Sea uh, and uh, kind of stretched on up from there, kind of came on around uh, the area of the Black Sea. Now, in the meantime, there were another group of people that were over further east. If you look in the area between the Black and the Caspian Sea, that's a mountainous area through there. Uh, just down to the south of that area was the area of the, of the Elamite and the Medes. And, of course, the Persians on down a little bit further, coming on into what is now, uh, let's say, the uh, northern part of modern Iran, uh, getting into portions of uh, also the northern part of modern Iraq. Well, the Elamites and the, and the Medes were in uh, these areas. Now, there was uh, the, uh, the Elamites were conquered by the Medes, and the Elamites lost their independence. There was a prophecy of that uh, back in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 49. <laughs> Jeremiah 49, verse 34. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So this is a prophecy uh, about Elam. This is uh, in the time approximately 600 B.C. And the Lord said... I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. I'm going to break their power. Upon Edom will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and I'll scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall no nation, whether the outcasts of Elam shall not come. I'll cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life, and I'll bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger. I'll send my sword upon them till I've consumed them. And... Uh, I'll set my throne in Elam and will destroy from thence the king and the princes, says the Lord, but it'll come to pass in the latter days that I'll bring again the captivity of Elam. So ultimately, this prophecy starts out at the time of Jeremiah. It, tar it starts out with the fact that the Elamites were going to be conquered and they were going to be scattered. Now, the Medes conquered them, made a subject people out of them. But you see, the Medes themselves ran into trouble a little later. The Babylonians came, and they took over an empire. Uh, then the medo persian Empire grew up. And then uh, about 331 B.C., over 300 years before Christ, Alexander the Great's empire took over and smashed the Medes and the Persians. Well, at that point... Uh, at that point in time, there was a lot of pressure on, on this area. The Elamites were pretty well all a captive and a subject people to the Medes. Uh, but uh, by the time Alexander the Great took over and his invasions, as Western invasions took, force, uh, took place across this area, the uh, Medes and their Elamite uh, captive peoples came up north. They migrated up north. So here you have, if you're looking at your map between the Black and the Caspian Sea, they came up. And as they came up uh, around from the eastern part of the Black Sea, and Meshach and Tubal came around from the, uh, the western part of the Black Sea, that over in that area, sort of between the Black and the Caspian Sea, those groups of peoples met up. Uh, Meshach and Tubal uh, with the Medes and the Elamites. Well, there was some warfare that took place. This was in the period about uh, 300 years before the time of Christ. 
There was a certain amount of warfare that took place, but these peoples, uh, over a period of time, uh, managed to stay in the same general area. There was a certain amount of intermarriage, and uh, there, were, there was an alliance that developed among and between them. Now, what your map probably won't show, because most uh, of the biblical maps don't necessarily show uh, all of Europe all the way on up, you know, right now, if you look, if you do have a map that that uh, sort of gives uh, uh, an overview of of that area of the world going on up into northern Europe, uh, if you look up at at a European map, you know, up at the top, uh, you've got the Scandinavian area. You have a little sea that comes under there called the Baltic Sea. Now, the Baltics, uh, Baltic area has gotten a lot of uh, publicity recently because Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the Baltic nations are right there around that Baltic Sea, just, just south of Scandinavia, focusing out, uh, facing out on the sea. But there is an area that stretches. There are rivers that run from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea and to the Caspian Sea. In fact, it is such a, anciently particularly, it was such an easily navigable area that the entire distance from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea uh, could be uh, traveled with one or two uh, small porta- uh, portage, uh, portages of, of probably less than about 20 miles. Uh, they could sail the entire distance. Uh, so there was a lot of north-south trade that began to develop. Now, the people, the Medes... The, with their Elamite uh, uh, subjects and uh, the people of Meshach and Tubal, as they uh, formed sort of a, a uh, grouping of people that lived in the same general area, their languages were similar. The origin of the Slavic language uh, basically goes back to the people of, of uh, Meshach and Tubal, and uh, their language became the common language that was used there by this, uh, this uh, group of people. And as they lived in, in this area, well, they, they migrated on up. They followed the rivers. It was a very easy uh, route that came straight on up and took them away from some of this fighting that was going on down here. So they came on up to the northern part uh, of the area, and there was a lot of trade that went back and forth, up and down uh, the rivers, the, the Dniester and the uh, Don and the Volga, uh, these rivers that came down from the area up in northern Europe all the way down to the Black and the Caspian Sea. Well, they came down, they had a connection with the Greek world uh, the, because they came up to the southern part of the Black Sea. And so there was a lot of trade that went back and forth. This would bring us down to the time of Christ and coming on up for several hundred years after that. So these people came to speak a common language and to settle that area along the rivers uh, stretching kind of between, from the area between the Black and the Caspian Sea on up through those rivers uh, up to northern Europe. So they sort of made a a, a swing, almost like an L, uh, that came from northern Europe in kind of a line down to the Black Sea and across to the Caspian. Well, things went along like that for several hundred years, bringing us on up to three or four hundred years after the time of Christ. But there were problems going on further east because there were other groups of people over there. Uh, one of the sons of Japheth was Magog. Now, Magog it is from him that most of the, uh, uh, it is from Magog that uh, most of the Mongol peoples derive their names. Uh, the Mongols and uh, the uh, people of Mongolia derive their, their name from uh, him. He also had a brother by the name of Gomer that... Uh, uh, gave rise to many of these uh, many of these peoples uh, in that area. That uh, uh, that 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 you have there is a there is a there is an area as you kind of come up from China. Uh, you've got China proper, uh, then the area of uh, the uh, of Mongolia, and then the uh, then a broad geographical area called Turkestan. Now, there's not, Turkestan is not on a map, but there are a number of little places that, that are all derived from that group of people. What they have in, uh, and it's distinct from the nation that calls itself Turkey. Let me 
briefly explain. If you've noticed in the newspaper, if you've been following it, uh, you, you've heard all sorts of little obscure places mentioned, uh, and referred to in the Soviet Union, places like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzia and Turkmenia. Uh, well, these areas together with uh, the northern part of China, the Xinjiang province of China, uh, is an area that were basically Turk-speaking people. They go back, they derive from Gomer, uh, from one of the uh, sons there, uh, who is, is not mentioned by this name in the Bible, but the Arab historians uh, call him Turk. Uh, and it is from him that that group of people were derived. The people of modern-day Turkey, who are ethnically, if you see a picture of them, they're, they're different. They speak the same language. The people of modern-day Turkey descend from descendants of Esau, who at one time inhabited that area, took on the language, but later uh, separated out and, and invaded uh, what is now modern-day Turkey back about uh, 600 years ago. But uh, this area up through here, you've got the Chinese proper, Mongolia, and then the area of what are called the, the Turks and Tartars, uh, because the uh, this group of people, but uh, the Turks and Tartars, uh, and, the, and the Mongols are a kindred people. Uh, there's a similarity in their languages. These were people that at one time were further east, but they, as they expanded, they pushed west. And as they pushed west, then it pushed the people of uh, uh, the Medes and the Elamites uh, and that portion of Meshach that was down in that area pushed them on up further north. And so they filled in, in this area that is the southern Soviet Union, uh, that has all these unpronounceable republics down there, uh, this is the descendants of, of this group of people. Well, things continued on along, uh, and the, the people that we'll, we'll term the Slavic peoples, uh, because what they had in common was they spoke the language that came to be known as Slavic. Uh, the, it, it consisted of the descendants of Meshach and Tubal, consisted of, of uh, the Medes and their Elamite uh, captives, uh, spoke this language that originated uh, there in the area of Meshach, uh, the Slavic language. And uh, these people were up in this area between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea and sort of coming around there. They've been being pushed further and further west by these uh, invading uh, Mongol and, and Tartar peoples further east. Well, uh, in the meantime, down south of the Black Sea, the area of the Roman Empire has held sway. Uh, the Roman Empire has, has arisen, and, and uh, of course, at the time of Christ, uh, the emperor uh, Julius Caesar had died previous to then, and his nephew Augustus Caesar took over. The Roman Empire had its beginnings. Well, uh, about 300 years after the time of, of Christ, the Roman Empire split. Uh, split into what was called the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. Uh, it was originally divided because of, of admi to make it easier to administer, and the, the uh, uh, division finally became permanent, became more and more uh, set and established as permanent. Well, the Western Roman Empire had its capital at Rome. Uh, Latin was the language. The Eastern Roman Empire was much heavily, in, much more heavily influenced by the Greeks. Uh, it centered in the Greek-speaking world, which was Greece, and across into what is now modern-day Turkey, the, the ancient Asia Minor Peninsula. The old city of Constantinople, the original name of it was Byzantium. Uh, then Const Emperor Constantine came along, changed the name, enlarged it, named it after himself, being the humble sort that he was. Uh, Constantinople was the name that it was known by uh, throughout most of history. Uh, uh, modern, it's the modern day Istanbul, which is the, uh, there in uh, part of now modern day Turkey. But anyway, this division between the Eastern Roman Empire, which was basically a Greek, it was a Greek speaking empire, it, it, uh, uh, the emphasis was on the Greek culture, while the Western Roman Empire was dominated by the Latin culture, uh, out of Rome. So there was this distinction. Well, there gradually, of course, grew up to be distinctions uh, in religion, primarily uh, political division between the people in the Eastern Roman Empire, not wanting the ones in the Western Roman Empire to, to tell them what to do. Here was the Pope at Rome, who was uh, in Rome, and, and there were uh, the church in the East, 
became, as the division in the empire became more pronounced, they were less and less inclined to take their religious uh, orders from him. But uh, things continued to where they, they remained in the same communion on up for uh, about a thousand years after the time of Christ. Well, when we come on up to, let's say, the, the latter part of the 800s, about uh, uh, about uh, 1,100 years ago, uh, two brothers by the name of Cyril and Methodius uh, left the area down there of Constantinople and were sent as missionaries uh, up to convert the Slavic peoples, uh, the uh, peoples who spoke the Slavic language. Uh, they uh, came on up into that area, and they did. In fact, they even devised an alphabet because these people did not have a written alphabet. They derived an alphabet that's called the Cyrillic alphabet, uh, and uh, it's sort of derived from Greek, uh, but it utilizes some of the some extra letters because of of unusual sounds in the Slavic language. Now, this is the this is the alphabet that the Russians use to this day. If you ever see anything, a photocopy of anything, uh, you know that the Russians do, you look and you try to figure out the letters because it's not, it doesn't look familiar. Well, it's because they use a different alphabet. All the areas in the West use the alphabet that is derived from Rome. Uh, we, use, we all use the Roman alphabet, regardless of whether we speak uh, English or French or Spanish or Italian or, or uh, various languages. All the Western nations uh, utilize the Roman alphabet, uh, the Latin alphabet. But this particular alphabet that was derived from Greek was used uh, in the Slavic areas, used in Russia. Now, understand some of the distinctions here between... When you get into distinctions of language and alphabet and religion, these things mean that people lack the ability to communicate and they, they begin to lack a common cultural base. And so they diverge more and more in their own ways and they develop that way. Well, the, uh, this alphabet came in and there, there were conversions to uh, the Christianity that was taught. Uh, that came here uh, through these two individuals. Now, in the meantime, the uh, uh, Slavic group of people that were up in this area, kind of uh, between the Black and the, and the uh, Black Sea and the Baltic Sea, up and down this this river area, and particularly up, uh, they'd become a little more concentrated up in the northern part. Uh, there was a lot of there. There was not any clear organization. There were there was a lot of trading that was going on up and down, but there was war, there was strife, there was anarchy. Uh, the Vikings had continued to invade. They traveled up and down those rivers. Finally, things got into such confusion, uh, sort of an interesting uh, quote from Russian history, because the, the, the uh, founder of the Russian state was a Viking by the name of Rurik. And uh, uh, what it amounts to is, is uh, the quote from from uh, Russian history says that uh, the people there, the Slavic people, became so uh, sort of frustrated at, at the problems that they had that they decided that the best thing to do was get somebody from outside to agree to be their leader and they would submit to him and he would straighten things out. And so the, the reference in... in uh, Russian history is to the time of a voluntary submission to a strong foreigner who was to lead them to peace, order, and prosperity. That was what they wanted. And they had been unable to achieve that on their own. Uh, this is back uh, in 862, which would be a little over 1,100 years ago. Well, as we come on down to a great-grandson of his by the name of Latimer, uh, he introduced Christianity in uh, as the official religion, in fact, in 990, almost exactly 1,000 years ago. The Pope had wanted to go to Russia uh, last year to celebrate the 1,000th anniversary of, uh, of Christianity in, in Russia. But because of the problems going on, he wasn't allowed to go. Uh, but in 990, this became the official religion uh, there, this group of people. Now... About 60 years later, what's called the Great Schism, the Great Split between Rome and Constantinople took place. This is the split that resulted in the, in the Catholic world to the west and the Orthodox world to the east. 
the, uh, the result was that the area of the eastern part of the Slavs, uh, the, the group that came to be known as the Russians, which would basically be the people of uh, uh, the descendants of Meshach and Tubal, as well as uh, uh, the Medes, uh, who wound up settling in an area uh, right there next to them, the area of the Ukraine, uh, and on a, in, in portions of them into, into the area that's called White Russia or Bayela Russia. Uh, they, together with some of their southern uh, Elamite groupings, which were down a little further south, they all came under the connection to the Orthodox world. They uh, derived their bishops and their their the the education of the leadership all derived from the Greek speaking world down in Constantinople. They were cut off from that group of the uh, Elamites that had been conquered by the Germans uh, up further north, the area of modern Poland and on down into part of Czechoslovakia and uh, some of that area, all of which uh, goes back. Uh, these people were also uh, Elamites, but they they fell under the sway as, as the, uh, of the German realm, as the Germans had come across and sort of conquered that area, that uh, uh, the result was that they adopted the Catholic form of Christianity. So you came on down to the area of, of modern-day Poland or, and uh, most of Czechoslovakia and a portion uh, of... Uh, that's part of the problem right now in Yugoslavia between the Serbs and the Croats. Uh, you see, the, uh, uh, the uh, one group, the Serbs are Orthodox, Croats are Catholic. That's, that's the biggest difference between them, a slight difference in their language, but it goes back that as, as empires came to be, here were people, some of whom fell under the eastern sway, the sway of the old eastern Roman Empire with the Greek influence, some of them swell, fell under the sway of the old western Roman Empire with the Latin influence. Well, this shaped the, the let's say, the development of, of culture and thought in those areas. Now, the other major thing that came along a little while later that shaped it was we were talking earlier about the uh, the Mongols and, and the Tartars and this area over to the east. Well, the uh, about 200 years after the Great Schism, coming on up to uh, in the 1200s, uh, the Mongols began a period of great conquest under a leader called Genghis Khan. Now, Genghis Khan put together the greatest, uh, the, the, the most far-reaching empire that anybody had ever seen. He started, uh, conquered the area of China. The Mongols moved south into China. And then they swept all the way across, uh, and all the way across into, into Europe. They conquered the whole area that is now modern-day Russia. Came all the way into Poland, uh, all the way into portions of Hungary, uh, way on up into Europe, right up to, to the point of besieging the gates of Vienna and Austria. So all of this whole area, uh, this this area of modern-day Russia, the the uh, the uh, Slavic peoples to the north, all fell under the dominion of these Mongols who dominated them for over 200 years. Part of the animosity between Russians and Chinese goes back to the fact that uh, uh, the Mongols ruled the area for over 200 years and, and uh, really uh, uh, were the, the dominant group. Well, there was a lot of animosity. In fact, some of the problems right now as to why you got some of the ethnic unrest, one of the reasons the Jews have had so much trouble in, in, uh, uh, in, in Russia was when the Mongols took over. They needed to put somebody... They, they exacted heavy taxes. They were very... Uh, ruled in a very oppressive way. They needed people to, to be their tax collectors. And so, other than the Chinese that they used, uh, the, the, the locals that they used were either Jews or Armenians. They made them the tax collectors. Uh, and uh, so they collected taxes for them for over 200 years for, the, for these Mongol overlords. Which means, of course, that when the Russians finally threw off the Mongol yoke, uh, two groups of people they didn't like were Armenians and Jews, because these had been uh, employed as tax collectors for 200 years. Well, things continued on along through this period uh, of uh, 
a lack of independence in, in, in Russia. And finally, in the 1400s, in 1453, just less than 40 years before Columbus discovered America, uh, Constantinople finally fell. It was conquered uh, by uh, Muslim conquerors, uh, and uh, it, it collapsed. It fell. The, that was the end of the old Eastern Roman Empire. But in the meantime, there was a man uh, up uh, uh, north who had been, who was known as the Grand Duke of Moscow, uh, of Moscovy, uh, a man by the name of Ivan, who went into history as Ivan the Great. He uh, and his father before him had started throwing off the yoke of the Mongols uh, and uh, winning their independence. Well, Ivan married a lady by the name of Sophia. She was the niece of the last Byzantine emperor, the last Eastern Roman emperor. They were married by the Pope in Rome, uh, and uh, uh, Ivan then uh, considered himself having a promotion uh, because he had married the uh, heir of the royal family, the imperial family of the Eastern Roman Empire. So he, in the aftermath of that, took a new title. He took the title Tsar, uh, spelled in English either T-S-A-R or C-Z-A-R. Uh, it is the Russian form of the title Caesar. He viewed himself as the successor, as the continuation of the old uh, Roman Empire, the old Eastern Roman Empire that had, that had been conquered uh, there. Well, there became a period of, then the period of great Russian expansion uh, from the time of Ivan the Great in the late 1400s. Uh, Ivan ruled from 1462 to 1505. Began, they began this expansion that within a period of 150, uh, 160 years, uh, had stretched all the way across and pushed all the way across to Siberia. It was one of the greatest and most rapid expanses in history as, as the Russian state began to spread out. Well, uh, they moved on down. They conquered some of the, the Mongol peoples that had previously ruled them, and so they put together an empire that came on into modern times. That When the Tsars were overthrown in 1917, uh, what had been the Russian Empire, which was a collection of all the peoples that uh, the... Uh, that the Russian peoples had managed to subjugate, uh, this was transformed into the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So we, we come into a situation where we have uh, all of these groups of people, we've got all these historic animosities because they've conquered one another and dominated one another for periods of time, uh, their religious differences, and so we've got all these things that are, that are going on. Now, when we come to beginning to look at it from a prophetic standpoint, in Daniel chapter 2, we find that in verse 31 that Nebuchadnezzar had seen a vision of a great image. Uh, the image his head was of gold, the breast was of uh, silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet part of iron and part of clay. In verse 34, you saw till that a stone was cut out without hands, and it smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. And uh, all of this, the whole thing was broken and became like chaff. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was told that the kingdom of gold, the head of gold, represented him in verse 38, the Babylonian Empire. Another empire, another kingdom was to arise after him in verse 39, uh, which was the Medo-Persian Empire uh, that uh, swallowed up Babylon. And then a third kingdom of brass, uh, which was Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. Then in verse 40, a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. This, of course, the fourth part of that succession was the Roman Empire. Uh, and as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, uh, this empire is going to subdue everything. Now... You saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of porcelain, ceramic, and part of iron. The kingdom will be divided. And we see that uh, uh, in verse 42, the significance of that is that the toes, uh, part are of iron and part of clay, the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken or partly brittle. And... Uh, uh, 
in the days, verse 44, of these kings, these final ten kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So we look and we see a a run of history from the time of Nebuchadnezzar all the way down until the time ahead of us when Christ returns. Now, we have always commented that the two legs... The legs were symbol, the legs of iron symbolized the Roman Empire. We've always commented that this had significance because the Roman Empire split into two divisions: the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, and this was represented by the two legs as they came down, culminating finally in the two feet, ten toes. And we find that there is uh, this union of ten final kings that Christ destroys and is returned to establish his kingdom. Now, the focus of Daniel 7, the succession of Daniel 7, the focus of Revelation 13, Revelation 17, all focuses on the the series of events that transpired in the Western Roman Empire, the Latin Germanic uh, Roman realm. But At the times that all these things were going on, there was also something going on in the East. Now, we've already commented on a little of the historical background of how that was centered in the Greek-speaking world of of, uh, of the Byzantine Empire that ultimately uh, was succeeded by the Russian Empire of the Tsars, Uh, this uh, Slavic uh, confederacy, uh, an empire that was put together that uh, drew different individuals Uh, who were claiming to be the successor of Caesar. You had the Kaiser in the German realm and the Tsar in the Russian realm. And both terms trace back, both titles trace back to Caesar. Kaiser is just the German spelling for Caesar. Largest hotel in Vienna for many years was the Hotel Romanov Kaiser, the Hotel of the Roman Emperor. Took its name from the the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperors, who who were, uh, you know, that was the title. We we say emperor in English, but uh, in German, which they spoke, they said Kaiser. Uh, he was not the Ro- he was not the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the uh, the Romanov Kaiser. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, so you had two individuals. Uh, two uh, groups who, who each claim to be the successor of Caesar, the Tsars uh, of the Russias in the east and the Kaisers of the Germans uh, in the west. Now, as we come on down in, according to Daniel 2, we're going to see, finally, uh, after a distinction between these groups all the way down, when we see the final union at the end, we're going to see ten toes, five from each foot. So, what should we expect? We should expect that we're going to draw both from the, the Orthodox, Slavic, uh, Greek realm, as well as the Catholic, Germanic, Latin realm, uh, to the West. That we're going to draw nations from both of those heritages into this final union of ten. Now... Let's come on down. Let's, let's go a little further. We see here these ten kings mentioned in Daniel 2. Let's go back to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 17, in uh, uh, verse 1, it says, There came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and said, Come here, and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, what are the many waters? Uh... Verse 15 says, The waters which you saw where the whore sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So it represents a great multinational entity. Now, it is described as a woman, a fallen woman, uh, a great prostitute. The church, God's true church, is described as a, as a woman, as a virgin, uh, who has remained loyal and faithful to Christ. Uh, here is one that is described not as... Uh, a virgin who has remained loyal and faithful to Christ, but is a great prostitute, with whom, verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. In other words, she's entered into various illicit relationships with various political leaders. She's looked to them for protection uh, as her protector and provider. She's entered into various alliances of exchanging her favors uh, to receive their protection and their provision, rather than being faithful and looking to Christ. 
Now, we come on down and we see her sitting on a great beast, uh, a great creature. She is, in a sense, in the saddle, uh, riding this creature that is described as having seven heads and ten horns. And she has a name on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So here is the, 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 Babylon, the Babylonian mystery religion grown great. We find her described in verse 6 as drunken with the blood of the saints. Uh, in other words, having been the cause of martyrdom and uh, intoxicated by that success. Then we find this beast, this creature that had been described in greater detail in Revelation 13 that uh, uh, had, had ceased because, you know, the, the Western Roman Empire, the focus uh, in prophecy is on the Western Roman Empire. That's where we've always focused. The, pro- the focus is on the Western Roman Empire. Uh, that was the, the primary successor. But there was also an Eastern realm that doesn't really uh, become prophetically significant until you get down to the very, very end, the final ten toes. But this Western Roman Empire, the Roman Empire collapsed. It received a deadly wound uh, in 454. It ended, and then the deadly wound was healed. A little over a hundred years later, Justinian, the Eastern Emperor, restored the empire in the West. And we find that uh, the seven heads are described as seven mountains, seven kingdoms on which the woman uh, sits, seven kings in verse 10. So the seven revivals of the Roman Empire uh, in the West were dominated by the woman. And the revivals we've normally uh, focused on as, as being from the time of Justinian, the time of Charlemagne, the time of Otto in the German Empire, the Habsburg Empire, uh, the time of Napoleon, that... Uh, uh, sixth revival that uh, Mussolini's revived uh, uh, Roman Empire that entered into alliance with, with Hitler uh, in World War II, and then a final seventh revival. Now, we're told in verse 12 that the ten horns are ten kings. You see, the seventh head, the one that hasn't arisen yet, has ten horns. Now, these ten horns are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet, but have received power as kings one hour with the beast. These will have one mind, and they'll give their power and their strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, because he's Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The um, So, these ten horns of Revelation 17, obviously, are the ten toes of Daniel 2. They represent the final ten kings that... Uh, that Jesus Christ is going to deal with when he returns. But here in Revelation 17, we're told, these ten kings will give their power to the beast. They will give their power to this final end-time leader for a short time. Now, why do people, why do leaders give up power? Why would anyone voluntarily give up power? Why do they give up power or freedom? Because they're scared. That's the only reason people voluntarily give up power. They give up power when they get scared. They're afraid that everything is going to collapse. They're going to lose their, their security. They're going to lose prosperity. Uh, they're, 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 uh, they're threatened with anarchy. They're threatened with collapse. They're threatened with everything falling apart. And they look for a strong man. They look for somebody who can bring order out of chaos, who can prevent exactly the same thing that... The, that uh, uh, sort of an interesting parallel, something that the Russian peoples did 1,200 years ago when finally they decided to voluntarily submit to a strong foreigner who was, and I'm quoting, to lead them to peace, order, and prosperity. This is out of one of the old Russian chronicles, dates back uh, uh, a, a reference to, to their selection of a foreign leader 1,200 years ago because they wanted peace, order, and prosperity. And they needed somebody who could sort of bring order out of chaos. We're going to see an event that is going to threaten modern-day Europe. Now, in order for this, this third entity, you know, all along, up until now, for, since World War II, everybody in the Western world is sort of focused on the United States and Russia. And, and the whole world had to choose up sides between uh, the, the Americans and the Communists. And it was Americanism versus communism. And and, and the whole world had to fall into two camps. Now, there's no way that what we have viewed in the Scripture as a third power block is this European revived Roman Empire. Where was that going to come in? 
Obviously, a vacuum, a political vacuum, had to exist for something else to emerge. What's happened is we no longer have a bipolar world. We no longer have a world where everybody is either allied with the Russian communists or the American capitalists. What we see right now is that Europe, Western Europe, uh, in, uh, dominated by, by, uh, by Germany in the, in the common market, the European community, that a, uh, is becoming more and more the, the emerging uh, power because they have a, 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 an economic power in Western Europe. But now you see that Eastern Europe is looking to them. They want what Western Europe has. They want what they have. And as they're looking there, uh, it's creating instability throughout Europe. One thing that the Western Europeans can't afford to have happen is for all the Eastern Europeans to leave where they are and come over and move in to Germany and France and some of these other countries because it would just absolutely sink them. They, they couldn't absorb all those millions of people. So we're looking at, at the beginnings of an economic uh, coming together. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel 27. Here is a lamentation for Tyre. Now, ancient Tyre is used uh, to symbolize the, the commercial and economic aspect of, of the modern-day Babylon the Great. Now, understand that Babylon the Great has, is used in the Scripture to symbolize both uh, a religious entity, a political military uh, power, and an economic power. That all of those aspects of religion, of of uh, military and political might and of economic power, all of those things are linked. All of those things are tied together in this final, uh, th this final uh, system that is going to come together uh, that is described in the Bible uh, as Babylon the Great. Ancient Tyre was used as a model for the economic aspect. Uh, the... Uh, Babylon was used as descriptive of the religious aspect, and uh, Asher are the Assyrians of the political and military aspect, because it contains all of these groupings. But notice here in uh, Ezekiel 27, and I'm going to show you that Ezekiel 27, because when we go through Ezekiel 27, uh, I want to show you some of the, the verses here talking about this economic uh, combine. Then we're going to go back to Revelation 18, where it describes Babylon the Great and the fall of Babylon the Great. And we're going to see that some of Revelation 18 is actually quoted out of Ezekiel 27. And so that's why I say we can identify Babylon, the economic aspect of Babylon the Great with uh, the tire of Ezekiel 27. And proof of that is going to be that when we, when we finish this here in Ezekiel 27, take my word for it for about five minutes, and we're going to go back to Revelation 18, and I'm going to show you that some of what's described in Revelation 18 is actually quoted from Ezekiel 27. It's describing the same thing. But notice here as it describes this uh, uh, great uh, entity, and it talks about the, uh, uh, all of the grouping of peoples. You see, what we have is a great multinational economic combine. It talks about the, uh, in verse 7, it talks about Egypt uh, and the Isles of Elisha. Uh, this is uh, the word, uh, this is the term from which modern day Greece derives its, its term. The Greeks refer to themselves uh, as uh, the Hellenes. Uh, that uh, is the, the term that they use, and, and it's derived from this term, Elisha. Uh, but it refers to Egypt, to Greece. Coming on down, verse 8, the inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were your mariners. Uh, Gebal, referred to in verse 9, this is the area of Lebanon. Uh, verse 10, they of Persia and of Lud and of Phut were in your army, your men of war. Now, some of this area, some of this part would uh, uh, be a reference some of these peoples we find uh, there uh, stretching on over into India uh, and into uh, uh, the area of uh, uh, portions of Iran. 
It talks about here was were, were armies that were recruited from uh, some of the areas of the east, from, from India, and uh, many of the Puttites uh, are sort of two branches of them, an eastern and a western branch, uh, the eastern branch uh, uh, there in the northern part of India. It talks about uh, the uh, various groups. In verse 12, Tarshish was your merchant. Reference to uh, the Japanese, Javan, Tubal, and Meshach. They were your merchants. So here is uh, here is uh, Tubal and Meshach uh, being involved in this. They traded the persons of men. Oh, so here was trade in 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 people. Now other prophecies show that the descendants of Israel are going to be taken captive. Uh, here is trade in people. Here is, uh, in effect, slave labor for, for uh, concentration camps. Uh, here are groups of people, and it describes uh, here uh, Meshach and Tubal being involved in that. They of the house of Togarma, which is, is a reference to uh, some of the uh, Far East, the, the, uh, the uh, peoples of what would be termed the Southern Soviet Union, the Turkic-speaking areas on up into Siberia. Uh, talks about uh, men of Dedan were your merchants. Syria was your merchant, verse 16. Uh, verse 17, at the beginning of this, uh, Judah and the land of Israel were your merchants. They traded in your market wheat. So here is a worldwide economic combine that includes everybody. Talks about Damascus was your merchant. Um, and it uh, talks about going to and fro uh, here. Uh, talks about the, uh, uh, the Arabs in uh, verse 21. And uh, uh, on down in verse 22, uh, some of the East African, Sheba and Ramah, uh, goes through. And it talks about, uh, uh, in verse 23, it talks about the Assyrians and various ones. Uh, all of these... Uh, various ones coming back and forth talks about the ships of Tarshish again in verse 25. And then it says in verse 27, your riches and your fares, your merchandise, your mariners, your pilots, your caulkers, the occupiers of your merchandise, all your men of war that are with you and in all your company that is in the midst of you shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of your ruin. The suburbs shall shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots. All that handle the oar, the mariners, and the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships and shall stand and cause their voice to be heard against you, and they'll cry bitterly and cast dust upon their heads. Uh, they'll weep, verse 31, verse 32. In their wailing, they'll take up lamentation for you and lament over you. Saying, what city is like Tyrus, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? When your wares went forth out of the seas, you filled many people. You did enrich the kings of the earth with a multitude of your riches and your merchandise. In the time when you shall be broken. And it talks about how, verse 40, 35, all the inhabitants of the isles shall be astonished. Their kings shall be afraid. And the merchants, verse 36, among the people shall hiss at you. You shall be a terror and never shall be any more. Now, with that fresh in mind, let's turn back to Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Verse 32, great angel came, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of demons, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You see, we're, we're told in uh, uh, verse 30, in verse 9, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously, with her shall bewail and lament for her. They will see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for her torment, crying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, in one hour is your judgment come. The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, describes all the various things, all... Uh, Verse 13, cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves. The fruit that your soul uh, lusted after are departed. And the merchants, verse 15, which, may, which were made rich, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city. Verse 17, in one hour so great riches has come to naught. Every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, as many as trade by sea, stood afar off, 
cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? They cast dust on their heads and cried, Alas, alas, that great city. So, we find a parallel. Because what we find described in Revelation 18 is an end-time parallel to what Tyre anciently was merely a type of. A great uh, economic combine that has literally worldwide implications. So we see a worldwide economic combine that is going to come together. An attempt to link and bind all people everywhere together in this great uh, worldwide economic order. We find that the uh, when we put Ezekiel together with Revelation 18, it's very clear that uh, many of the peoples of what we've termed the Soviet Union are certainly going to be involved in this worldwide economy. They're going to be linked in this uh, worldwide uh, economic uh, connection. But we find, according to Revelation 18, that this system is going to collapse. It's going to be destroyed. This city, Babylon the Great, that represents the uh, headquarters of this final end time uh, combine, is going to be destroyed. God says uh, in verse 3 of Revelation 18, All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Now, in Revelation 17, we read uh, about the religious aspect of it, uh, called the the great whore, Babylon the Great. And in Revelation 17, too, we saw that she is described as dominating many peoples and languages with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. She's made the inhabitants of the earth drunk, drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we find the same thing. Revelation 17 focuses on the religious and military part of it. Revelation 18 focuses on the economic aspect. So she's described here, God tells his people, verse 4, come out of her that you be not partakers of her sins, receive not her plagues. We find a description, verse 8, her plagues will come in one day. Death, mourning, and famine shall be utterly burned with fire, strong as the Lord God who judges her. And it describes various ones in verse 9, standing afar off. Well, they see the smoke, they see the cloud going up, and they stand afar off, and there is great lamenting, because in one hour her judgment has come. Now, this is a pretty good description of a nuclear holocaust. I uh, hear people standing afar off for fear of her torment. Don't want to get close enough for for any of the fallout, but they see the big mushroom-shaped cloud, and they know that it's all over with. So here is a system that is going to come together, that's going to have worldwide economic implications, but it is ultimately going to collapse in internal strife and warfare. Let's go back to Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51, here prophecy dealing with the with Babylon, and uh, in uh, notice Jeremiah 51 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations have drunk of her wine. The nations are mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her. Now here's here are verses that are paraphrased in Revelation 17 and 18. Now how is she going to fall? What's going to happen? Well, verse 11, make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it, the kings of the Medes. I hear people in the, in, in the uh, European part of the Soviet Union, the, the area of the Medes would particularly refer to the area of the Ukraine, perhaps uh, uh, Bayela Russia, White Russia as well. Uh, here's a gr- here are a group of people that at one time are going to be allied with it, and yet they're going to be stirred up to destroy. They're going to be the source of destruction. So it says in verse 12, Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon, make the watch strong, set up the watchman, prepare the ambushes. The Lord has devised and has done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. O you that dwell among many waters, abundant in treasures, your end is come, the measure of your covetousness. So it goes on down here, and God says 
uh, I am against you, verse 25. Verse 26, they'll not take of you a stone for a corner nor a stone for a foundation. You'll be desolate forever. This is quoted back in Revelation 18. Set up the standard in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations against her. Call together against her the kingdoms of Ararat. Now, where is that? Well, that's down in the Caucasus Mountains. That's in that area. The southern Soviet Union is having so much trouble right now. The Armenia and Azerbaijan and all that area. That's the, the kingdoms of Ararat. Meaning and Ashkenaz. Here we're looking at the, uh, the Turkic areas there of, of places like... Uh, Tadzikistan and Uzbekistan and, Kedz, and Kazakhstan and all this area, this vast Soviet Central Asia, as it's termed. Uh, the um, appoint a captain, verse 28, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes. Oh, so here, here's going to be uh, an alliance that's going to be put together that some of the Ukrainians are going to, uh, some of that area of, of uh, uh, European uh, Soviet Union, the area uh, there is going to put together, it's going to link up some of these other peoples, and the land is going to tremble for every purpose of the Lord, verse 29, shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. So the Lord is going to bring his vengeance. Now, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to Revelation 17, or uh, again, and I want to call your attention to something else. Now, how is it that some of these people can be part of the... Uh, how can you have some of the... Uh, uh, we're talking about the, the final ten kings, five toes on each foot, that you have some of the nations of the West uh, the, uh, that, you know, that, that are the, the heirs of the old Western, Roman, Latin, Germanic realm... And you have powers from, from the Eastern Europe that are the heirs of the Slavic Orthodox uh, Greek realm coming together, you know, uh, that are giving their power to one uh, super leader. So you're going to have ten nations or groups of nations. Actually, what the Scripture says is ten leaders. It doesn't say how many nations each leader is over. It says ten leaders, ten kings, ten, uh, ten rulers. And that's, of course, what the ten toes symbolize, is ten rulers. So some of what, uh, see the problem of trying to guess exactly which country. You know, nations can, can come together and they can fall apart, they can make new, new alliances. Uh, it's a matter that you've got ten rulers, uh, that five of whom are the heirs of the, of the Slavic uh, Greek realm, and five of which are the heirs of the Latin Germanic realm, uh, the heirs of the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire coming together, giving their power to one great leader. Now, how can you have that? And yet, some other scriptures show how the Medes and some of these are actually going to be used to destroy Babylon. Well, notice, if we go back to Revelation seventeen twelve, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no power as yet. They'll receive power as kings one hour with a beast. These will have one mind, shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They'll make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. He is Lord of lords and king of kings. Those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. He said unto me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns which you saw upon the beast... These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For the Lord has put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God be fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. What, we're, what we are clearly told is this alliance of ten kings, ten rulers coming together, giving their power to this great end-time ruler... The time is going to come before the end when they're going to realize they've been had. They're going to realize that they've been caught up in something, that they've been taken advantage of, that it's not what it purports to be. There's going to be a reaction, a response, that is particularly going to see the eastern part of that, uh, that is going to launch an attack, that, that the system is going, to, is going to begin to collapse from within itself. And that... Uh, uh, you, you know, part of what you've got going on right now, you, you have people, you, you've got a lot of different 
things. You're going to have people who are going to go along with the system, but they've been raised with something else. And they're going to go along with it because they think it provides the answers. And when they see that it doesn't, you're going to have a pendulum swing. And there's going to be a reaction there, particularly in the areas that constitute much of the Soviet Union, that is going to be responsible for actually launching an attack uh, that is going to devastate uh, portions of Western Europe. See, Daniel 11 tells us, speaking of the king of the north, the beast power, um, that at the time of the end, verse 40, the king of the south, this is speaking of the, the Islamic power centered in, in the Arab world, is going to push at the king of the north, this beast power centered in Europe, and the king of the north is going to come against him like a whirlwind and enter into the glorious land. Now, you know, there's no way that Europe can come in and invade the Middle East and take over the whole thing uh, if world events continued along like they were with the Soviet Union being a major player. There's no way they can do something like this without the Soviet Union uh, at least tacitly agreeing to it. But they're going to come in, they're going to overpower the whole Middle East and do all of these things. But eventually, verse 44, tidings out of the East and the North are going to trouble him. They're going to get word that some of the areas to the East, China, what we find is that the whole world is going to be brought into at least uh, economic connection with this religious, military, political system. The whole world is going to be brought into at least connection with it. Uh, the indication is that, uh, you know, China is going to tend to be a little bit apart, uh, but yet, nevertheless, uh, not they're not in a position to oppose it. But now there begins to, to stir up. Uh, animosity and resentment as some of the peoples that have constituted uh, the Soviet Union together with some of those in China, uh, you, you know, some of the old, uh, uh, let, let's say, successors of the communists began to recognize that, uh, uh, began to feel like they've really been had. Well, they're going to, uh, they're going to, there's going to become tidings out of the north and out of the east. And so the leader... The, uh, and, of course, Germany is going to be the dominant one on, uh, of the, uh, this beast power, is going to launch a surprise attack against the East. Because they're going to, at some point, uh, right about two and a half years into the tribulation, about a year before the return of Christ, they're going to launch a surprise attack with the idea that they will eliminate opposition before it comes. Well, that's going to stir up more opposition because what... Uh, many then of, of uh, the Russians are going to realize is that this system that they thought was going to bring them peace and prosperity and order, uh, this, uh, this new world order is not what it purports to be. And uh, there's going to be a retaliatory strike in Europe, uh, and then there's going to come this converging together of these armies this, uh, that's described uh, in the book of Revelation, this army of 200 million uh, from the east, from the kings of the east. There's no way you can put together an army of 200 million uh, that where China and India would not be major constituents. These are areas of the east. And certainly uh, much of, let's say, portions of Soviet Central Asia and that area uh, that's going to come across there. That, that the whole world is about to dissolve into uh, nuclear holocaust. That is the point at which Christ comes back, that it is described. The description we read in Ezekiel 38, I'll just comment briefly on that. The time setting of Ezekiel 38 is after the millennium has already started. Christ comes back, smashes the army, uh, the armies of the beast and of the uh, kings of the east, smashes those armies uh, there and destroys them in the valley of Jehoshaphat outside Jerusalem and uh, uh, establishes his government in Jerusalem, regathers Israel. Several years into the millennium, perhaps five or six uh, or seven, you know, within the, the first few years, we're going to find an alliance that is sort of made up of the remnants of this group of people uh, that is going to be led by uh, the uh, Asiatic area of it. 
centered there. It's going to include Gog, the land of Magog. It's going to include, uh, this is Ezekiel 38.2, Meshach and Tubal. It's going to include uh, much of the, the Chinese, Mongolian, Russian area uh, that is going to put together an alliance. This is after Christ has returned. This is sort of the remnants. A few years later, they're going to put together a giant army uh, coming on down, including uh, uh, verse 5 makes plain that India will be uh, providing uh, much of this, Gomer and Tagarma, the area of Soviet Central Asia and Siberia. They're going to put together a vast army that's going to come down uh, to visit, to attack, verse 8, the land which has been brought back from the sword that's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been laid waste been always waste, but is now brought forth from the nations, they'll dwell safely. You see, they're going to say in verse 11, I'll go up to the land of unwalled villages. Here, they're going to look and they're going to say, you know, here's an area that has no army. They're not protected. This is several years after the catastrophe that has occurred. And they're going to come up and say, you know, we're going to finally get on our feet by we're going to come in and take what they've got. Of course, that army is totally destroyed in Revelation and Ezekiel 38. And then the government of God expands out and spreads into those areas, the areas uh, that it's going to take time. It's going to take a few years into the millennium before the government of God uh, is holding sway over all the earth. Uh, so the, the collection of these things that are going on, the, th- the events that are transpiring in the world right now, the things that are going on in Europe, are setting the stage. It's creating the chaos. It's creating the, the, the threat to security and prosperity and peace in the West. There is a spiritual vacuum that's been created. with Because communism was a religion. There is a spiritual vacuum that's been created. People don't have anything to believe in. Uh, There is a collapse of order. There's a collapse of the economy. There is a vacuum that is being set up that is setting the stage for the emergence of the final world order, that final revival of the Roman Empire. And it's in the days of those final ten kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. On the Feast of Trumpets, we will focus in on that part of it.